Hey everyone, welcome back to the Idiom Meta Connection podcast season two. And we are going to continue on our journey of interviewing young influential people. And on today's show, I have to admit, is one of my favorite people to interview. I've been privileged enough to interview him twice on my other podcasts. And but before we introduce him, I will just give you a bit of a blurb about how much stuff this guy's done. Okay, so he's written an amazing book that's won many awards. I was going to list them and I thought, no way, I'm not going to list them. There's too many to list. Um, he wrote a book called Invisible Boys, who's won, again, those awards. And it's a, an emotional tale of identity, sexuality and suicide derived from personal experience. And it's about three teenage boys. And I remember when I met this young guy, I bought the book and read it in one day and was totally absorbed. And um, the book has now been uh, like optioned to be made into a series, and that's going to be very, very exciting. A movie or a series, but um, he'll tell us more. He's also writing his next novel, which will be out very soon. And I'd like everyone to scream and shout for one of our favourite Australian people, Holden Shepherd. Hi, Holden. How are you? G'day, Joey. Mate. It's good to be back here. I know you're like you're the very you're the only person that I've. Have been that's been here three times. I've got a few. I'm a triple whammy. Okay. You're a triple whammy. I've got a few doubles, but you're the third one. And I think it's you know I really do feel I have to say I'm really really privileged, and I want to say thank you because I know that when I watch and follow you on Facebook, you are so busy with you're like literally everywhere, right? And I'm thinking this guy just says yes, so I have to. And I've, I've never met you, so I do have to say again, thank you for um, giving us time. I, it's my pleasure. I really, you know, the first time we chatted, I was like, this guy loves doing the deep dive in an interview. And I thought I want to chat to him again. So, you know, anytime you say you want to chat, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And this is, and also this is, I think I really wanted to interview intelligent people to do this podcast. So as we were talking before we went live, I explained to you what it's about. So we always start off with um, the word fulfillment. So how does Holden do fulfillment? How do you know if you're happy? It's a really interesting question and a really interesting time for that question to come up for me um, because, because I've been I've been wrestling with this for the last probably two or three years in terms of what makes me happy and and what do I want to keep doing because I I had one dream in life since I was seven and it was to become a published novelist um, and it happened about just over two years ago and it was awesome and lots of good things have happened and. I, I didn't feel happy, you know. Like I, I didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't, uh, I didn't feel the joy that I thought I would feel in achieving a life goal. I thought I would feel fixed and fulfilled, and you know, I would somehow find a better way of navigating the world. And actually, I didn't at all. What did you feel uh, instead? Like I, I like there, there's huge joy. There's lots of like really fun, good things that happen when you make a life goal happen. But it was kind of like like having a good day at work. Right. Like, like I had lots of really good days at work. Mm. But then I came home and I was like, wow, I'm still terrified of everything. I'm right. still sad. I'm still disconnected. I'm still mentally yeah. fucked up. Do you, you feel, know, like do I, you feel like, has there, has there been any gap between then and then? Cause I was thinking while you were talking, like I remember in our first interview, like even looking at you now, how you, if, it was only a year and a bit ago, but you were so much younger. <laughs> so you've definitely matured a lot. So like, has there been a gap in regards to, have you found some happiness? Yeah, I, um, I, I've been like more, more aggressively focused probably the last six months or so on, um, I need to do what's going to make me feel good. And that doesn't always mean saying yes um, yeah. to everything. So I started saying no to a lot of things. Um, and I started, I had a couple of people who passed away in my family. And Sorry. one of them was my uncle. And uh, people had, I, I, I did the eulogy for him. And, and my cousins were talking about how he used to kind of sit there. And you know, he was a brickie. And he, he, you know, built a nice house. He lived there with his, his wife and he had his kids. And, you know, um, every morning he'd just get his cup of coffee and sit on the, on the porch and had a beautiful view of the ocean is up in Jerotten. And like, he just did that every morning and just sat there and just was like, Hey, this is what I've got. Um, and just that, that really struck me. I was like, I, I don't do stuff like that. And so I started yeah. to go forget about trying to achieve anything. Like I it just stopped being as important as it used to be to me. And I just thought like, I just want to be happy each day. 
Yeah. Like just each day I want to do really quiet, normal, basic yeah. things that just make me feel good. Do you think that he, you know, when, I mean, did you ask him or did you know or did you feel that he was happy doing that? Oh, I knew the guy. Like he was just a really, he was, he was my uncle and he was just a very happy, contented guy. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, I didn't have that conversation with him. This, this conversation happened after he'd passed away and I just thought, you know, like that, that's all really life is. Yeah. Like, like, uh, you know, I'm going to die whether it's in, you know, 70 years or whether it's in seven, like, like no one knows what's going to happen. You don't know when your number will be up. And so I just, I just wanted to just <laughs> turn off that, that conversation of like achieve, 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 and just start going with like, Every day needs to be about feeling happy. Yeah. I mean, like, it's good. I mean, I love the fact that you're young and you're doing that. Like, I only discovered it, like, I've always thought I was doing it, but I only really discovered it this year by losing my mum. And I realised that what you're saying is that happiness is just about every moment when you're doing stuff rather than planning or wanting more, right? And it is, and that's why the podcast has been created. So, yes. um, Holden Shepherd, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. I, I was born ready. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So let's start off with an easy question. What's the weirdest thing that you do when you're alone? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to tell you now, I did not pick these questions. All right. Remember, the questions are picked for you by the system. Okay. Okay. <laughs> wow. And um... you can answer it any way you want. I mean, like, I, you know, just think about when you're alone and we doesn't have to be seen as anything is bad, but you know that people may not do it regularly and you're doing it. Sure. Let me think. I know what your mind no, went, I, though. No, I sing a lot. <laughs> I sing a lot when I'm home by myself, which is probably not something I would do. Well, it's definitely not something I would do in public or in front of other people. Right. And do you sing, um, like, whole songs or do you sing – what type of songs do you sing? I sing – yeah, I sing along to a lot of, a lot of 90s, like – Post grunge, okay. um, yeah. like yeah, you know, like Red Hot Chili Peppers or Bush, or and so you got a record on and you're just singing along, or you're singing raw by yourself. Sometimes, sometimes a cappella because no one can hear me, no one can judge me. I love that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's probably the weirdest. I mean, unless you want to talk about wanking, but I mean, I feel like it's very. Hey, I mean, like, I don't think about. I don't think wanking is weird. No, neither do I. Unless, unless, like, unless you like, unless you're wanking with other things happening. <laughs> wow, you should see what I do. Um, no, like I just think that's like everyone does that when they're alone. But I don't think everyone sings to post brunch. Well, yeah, like I'm, I, I actually, I'm going to say I do this. I've got, I don't think I don't, never thought of my thing being weird, but I sing as well. But I actually produce full on operas <laughs> when I'm alone. It's like a full on play or TV show, and I go, "What am I doing?" And I invest yeah, right. so much into the characters. Um, all right, nice, so. Nice. Can you tell us if you've experienced imposter syndrome and how that impacted you? Yes. Um, imposter syndrome as an artist is massive and um, you experience it all the way up. You know, like as you're trying to become a published novelist, you, you're constantly going, I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet. And then you get there and you land on the same stage as other people and people who've won you know the miles franklin and the prime minister's awards and you know these big amazing people and you're like well i'm not as good as them um but actually they're feeling the same thing yeah. so it, it like I've, I've learned that it never actually goes away well go break go down into it like what was the what do you i mean like you've written an accomplished book so what what evidence are you putting into your head that made you feel like an imposter when you were when you were um, really being you were actually being celebrated yeah, I for the first, I think the first two awards that I got, um, I remember thinking like both of them I just discounted. Like like I was yeah. so excited to get them, but the first one I got, I was like, oh, I was probably the only one who entered. Like, which is a stupid. It's not true, but it was a stupid. You know, I was like, you know, they probably just felt like they had to give it to me. Oh. You know, or like you, I don't I, like I don't know. You know, like that is well, but it sounds but, was it like it sounds like you're wake. You know, you know who you are now. Maybe when you won it, you were figuring it out, and you didn't believe. You know, I remember when I when I praised you when I first met you, and you were really you were really uncomfortable compared to now. Now you sort of go, yeah, I just I want I deserve that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm, you know, maybe you know maybe yeah. I mean, like, because yeah. that's what really the imposter syndrome means, I think. It means that you don't believe that you belong there. But the reality is, is that 
you're the one that, that wrote the book and won. I mean, like, we would feel like imposters if we had to pretend. So it's, it is interesting how people – mm. did anyone in particular make you feel like that? Um, I, 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 you know, I grew up in a family where you don't – and probably just a culture, you know, Australia is like this, the tall poppy thing, right? So, like, yes. you don't want people giving you attention for achieving because then that means you're going to get cut down. So I was just like, eh, leave me alone. Well, they, um, they don't cut you down until they cut, they put, build you up first and then they cut you down, which I, is worse, I reckon. It's like, uh, stay, yeah. stay with the momentum and just be happy. Yeah, that, and you know what? The weirdest part of it was that I got, like, like on my way up as an emerging writer, like, everyone you meet is like, yeah, you can make it. Yeah, you can get published. Yeah, you can do this. And you just, you, you're surrounded by people who are cheering you on. And then... There was a point where like, it, was really, it was really stark as well. There was a point where I think I won the, the WA um, Premier's uh, mm. Literary Award and then like the same week I got the TV film option thing. There was two really big bits of good news and suddenly it, it dropped off. Yeah. Like whereas before everyone was like, yay. Um, and there were still lots of people, you know, readers were doing that, but all the people who used to be my peers like just stop talking to me. Right. Like so, have, so many, have you figured out? Have you analysed or figured out what that means? I've, I, I, I can't. Like, and, and the weird thing is, you've got so many people talking to you, uh, readers, you know, colleagues, people in the industry, that it's hard to even keep track of who has stopped. Yeah, talking yeah. To. I, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, the, I mean, I because I had the same experience this year for other reasons, but I did a lot of work in understanding it, and it is basically it's. We want to celebrate people and we really are their admirers, but when they become successful, it reminds us of failing, right? So that's, yeah. as, you're right, in America, the difference is in America, they, people will always cheer you because people then believe they can do what others are doing or people yeah. believe that they can live through that person, which is another version of celebration. In Australia, we don't like that. No, no, you, no I think you're right. American, um, my husband does a lot of work in France, at, like virtually. Yeah. And the French seem to very much champion their friends. Yeah. Um, but, um, and, you know, Australia, like, people are good with their mates. But I remember, yeah, just that, that total silence from a lot of people. Yeah. And one day come up to me and literally go, but I liked this. Um, you know, she's come up and she's like, congratulations, but I fucking hate you. And I went, cool, I totally get that. And thank you for actually saying it to my face because it just made me feel so much more chill. Yeah, that yeah. We could talk openly about, like, yeah. I know, hey. I know, but I think there needs to be another step. What right. Would that be? Thank you. Uh, congratulations, but I fucking hate you. And now, can we try and sort out the fact that we will always support you? Because the fucking hate yeah. you bit means I can't cope. Like when I was going through mine, one of my friends did the same thing. I got a call from a friend saying, "Hey, Joey, I can't be your friend anymore. You're too happy." <laughs> yeah so it's because yeah. i was happy through covid i felt i got punished and that is okay. cutting down so people just want everyone to be at their level if you don't if everyone doesn't make any doesn't don't succeed then it's better but when someone succeeds it's reminding us that that we're not doing it yeah yeah, yeah you might be right yeah. yeah all right um think back go back in time right and you're a little boy and i want you to share with us the most memorable holiday you've had with your family? What was one of the most memorable holiday experiences that you had? And if you feel like you want to also include maybe a comedy one or a bit of a, uh, a disastrous holiday, whatever, but yeah. something that you remember in your mind when you think about having a holiday with your family, what was something that you did and how did you do it? You know, well, I, I can tell you now, most of the holidays we had um, were not – very exciting. <laughs> That's okay. But did anything uh, got, exciting I happen? Have, I don't what, but we, <laughs> but we, like because I'm one of I'm one of six kids, so there was eight of us. So, mm -hmm. um, if we did a family holiday, we we'd be in a big like Mitsubishi bus. That was our family car. Yeah. Um, you know, like one of those eighteen vans, and uh, we had to have a trailer attached to the bus, which was for everyone's luggage and for everyone. So it was food. pretty loud and it was pretty big. It loud and big and you go and you know it's from like Geraldton to Perth and you go to Perth for a few days and you see family and then you go back to Geraldton. We didn't really do much more than that. Um, but did anything happen on the on the yeah, did anything special or, or funny or for you, you know, think about your teenagers or think that you yeah. know go, Oh, this is like my little secret or this is my little adventure that I had. 
Um, do you know what the only the only cool one we did was uh, when I was twelve when we went to Scotland, um, and that was cool. My sister had yeah. been over there to live, and so um, me and my little sister and my mum and dad, four of us as a little unit, went over there, um, and that was cool. Like that was the first time I saw like a big city because even yeah. though we visited Perth. You know, some people say Perth is not a big city, um, but even though we visited Perth, we would just stay in the suburbs. You know, I'd never been yeah. to like a big city, and so like the smell of traffic, you mm. know, like, like like the smell of car fumes, and like <laughs> literally traffic and people, people. everywhere. You know, yeah. like just on mass, I'd never seen. That. And was it was, was it how, a, how was it for you? I still have really fond memories. Like I've I've even got like I think I still have them. I've had <laughs> them for years. They were like clothes from that trip. That whatever laundry detergent we used had a certain smell to it. And I, I kept them for years because if wow. I smelled those clothes, yeah. I would go back to that feeling of like like actually being in the bigger world. Yeah, you yeah, know, like, yeah. Like I wasn't just in a little town in WA. I was, I was yeah. somewhere else. It was cool. Do you mind if I just um, expand on that? Like, because how many people you said in your family? Eight. Wow. So do you mind if I ask, like, I mean, I'm trying to comprehend, like, I have a smaller family, but I'm trying to comprehend what that must be like to be in a van, stop on the way, everyone has to get their toilet breaks, everyone's hungry, and, like, I just want to know what that was like. <laughs> like, what was that like for you? Because I guess that's special in a way. You know, do you have uh, do you have memories of it being good or do you freak go, oh, my God, that was a nightmare? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually... Um... I, I remember, you know, the nineties being really fun, like growing up in that world. Cause, cause we were the loud family. Like if people, if we came to someone's house, they were like, oh fuck, they're here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like we were just so loud. Um, but no, I think we managed the, um, you know, the trips, we would leave at like 2am. So all the kids were asleep. Like my parents really thought this shit through. So like there was no need for, you know, people to talk or people to be annoying. It was just everyone slept in the car. Yeah. Um, but no, it was a really, it was just chaos. It was growing up in chaos. And when I was a little kid, I'm, I'm number five of the six and there's right. a big gap in the middle. So my older siblings were like 11, 12 years older than me. So you, you would kind of, you know, stumble a few steps as a toddler and one kid picks you up and another kid picks you up and you, you kind of were constantly I don't know, around people. I mean, like, yeah, like uh, having a, a, a big family is so unique to having only one sibling. You know, like it's such oh, yeah. different. So look, this sure. question is could come across as being, um, you know, you don't want to, you may not want to answer it, but no one's going to hear it, so don't stress, okay? So I want you to think back, think about those people in your family, and I want you to tell us who your favourite was and why. <laughs> Like was mum, mum or dad a favourite? Was a sibling a favourite? You you know we all have a favourite, so don't say you don't have favourites, okay? Because I know you do. So who do you <laughs> feel like was your who's your favourite in your heart when I say that? Ask that question. Oof. <laughs> um, you're gonna oh, be so you're yeah. gonna be diplomatic, aren't you? You're gonna be so diplomatic. I will be, and and partly because no. Of, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you an answer, but I'll just say you know. Partly, you know, I've got fond memories of like the, you know, growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, whatever. Um, but I don't have a great relationship with everyone in my family now. Right. So, so that's a fraught thing. I don't usually talk about in interviews at all. Okay. Um, in terms of who I'm I, like, I, I've always been really close. So there was, there was four older siblings and then a big gap and then me and then my little sister. And right. We a little tiny one. So. Once everyone else had like grown up and turned eighteen and left the house, we were left growing yeah. up in the same house. So we we have always been really close. So I'll say my little sister. Yeah, cool. I mean that that, that, that makes a lot of sense, you know. Um, thank you for answering that because I know I actually threw that in. That wasn't in the list. <laughs> um, you bastard. <laughs> so where? How does Holden Shepherd get his news? Like, where do you? Because we've got such a a mass range now of people telling us what's going on. I'm mm. curious to know where you get yours and how you channel your beliefs and your view of the world. Where, what's your source? Um, Twitter, um, which is terrible. Um, but no, nowadays I, I, I mostly see what's, you know, if any big news is breaking, it's probably on Twitter because I'm on social media a lot for my, for my work um, slash doom scrolling really. 
but um, if if something is then going down, um, I probably look at the ABC website that has to be good coverage. Yeah, it's but you know, at the well. moment there's so many th- versions of things, right? So, yeah. are you someone that are you do you research or do you just do you know do you feel comfortable just listening to ABC or the Twitter and then you sort of feel like you know like like how do you come up with your opinion on something? Like, is it through research or do you just feel like inside you you have some sort of compass. Yeah, I, I'm not, like I feel like as an adult and after consuming news for enough years, you get a good kind of bullshit detector system. So you you find a news source that is reliable. You know, someone, some you know, if you see ABC or BBC or whatever, CNN, I don't know, uh, Reuters. You know, like like those big news services. You know, they they're rigorous, so they're gonna have um, they're gonna be true even if there is always some bias to the news. Um, so I tend to trust those. But sometimes if there's, like I used to teach um, my students that, you know, you, if you want to get a really interesting outlook, um, you know, look at the same event or the same issue covered by a, a really left-wing news source and then a really right-wing news source and then some someone who's just centrist or, or mm. maybe just sensationalising it. Um, and it's very interesting um, you learn a lot about um, <laughs> about what each one leaves out, mm. and, and each one does. And, and I tend to skew left, um, maybe centre left, maybe centre, um, <laughs> but, but I tend to skew maybe centre left. Um, so that would be you know where I land in general. But I still think it's very interesting to examine. Well, what does the left leave out? You know, because yeah. because there is always always bias, and if you read the right wing source, that's you know, I'm not talking far right, but I'm talking something that skews right that is still reliable, kind of go, oh, that fact wasn't left in there um, in the left-wing article. And same thing and vice versa. If you're reading the sensationalised right-wing kind of murder stuff, um, you, you're going to go, oh, okay, that's that version. Then you look at the actual, you know, ABC when you go, huh, Murdoch left that out. That was quite important. Why yeah. didn't he put that? You know, so it, I just think you learn a lot from doing that. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's useful to do it all the time. Yeah. Because once you've got a rough sense of what the biases are, you can kind of, Suss it out. Yeah. And so how did that – I remember, again, in other, our other interviews, there were particular questions I asked you that got you, you know, fired up. So do you get fired up over – do you look at the injustices in the world and that fires you up? How, are you, how do you, as a writer, as a creative, um, feel fulfilment when the world can sometimes feel the opposite? Yeah, I used to get angrier than I do. You are a lot calmer and a lot more mature. Am like, I? Well, <laughs> well, I can I'm ask. More... I can ask you another question to find out. No, <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. Yeah. I, I, I'm maybe I don't know if I'm. I don't think I'm more zen necessarily, but I, um, I used to feel like I. Uh, I used to get drawn into being kind of loud and activisty. Yeah, about, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean? Like, the, like the, 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 do you still feel that need to do that? No, but I reserve the right to do it if I get pissed off. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I, 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 if there's something right on my doorstep, like I did it earlier this year where there was conversion, gay conversion therapy happening in uh, in WA, regional WA in Albany, and then it went to Geraldton. And I spoke out a lot. I wrote some pieces in the media. I did a lot of media, radio, yeah. print around speaking out against this stuff. And it, it, it takes a toll on me, so I don't like to do it. Um but I did it because it was important and it was on my doorstep and I felt like my voice could actually contribute something quite meaningful yeah. to help people who might think, who might be misled by that conversation. So when it's something like that and it's really close, I will sometimes dive in and go, okay, I'm going to speak out on this. But um, I don't, I, I deliberately avoid activism that's, you know, if it's somewhere else in the world, if it's something that's not quite something I can really speak to, Yes, I will probably agree with what the activists are saying and I'll probably agree with what my friends are tweeting and screaming about. I probably agree with those points. But if I invest all of my time into that, I will, I'll, I'm permanently setting my brain into like fight or flight all the time. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. The world is a threat for gay men. Yeah. And that, that's not going to help me thrive. That's yeah. Be- I mean, you sort of answered it earlier on when you said that you found now that you can say no and... And you know, do you remember the the the, the passion that you had in our first interview? Do you remember the question? 
I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember what fired me up. What, what, what it, was, it was. Well, we were at the beginning of COVID, and there was a, pos- a possibility that the arts was going to be shut down, and you got so fired up. So you know, it's it's good to see that you know it's important to follow the things that you want to get fired up about because you can't be an activist for everything. Um, I know that you're a, you're a very grounded, and you are very traditional in maybe the way that you see friends and all that. So how does one become in your trust circle? What's the Hold and shepherd valuation for trusting someone. Oh, um, there's no one in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> really? I'm Sicilian. I trust no one. No, I'm that's Sicilian. Not true. <laughs> Speak against the family, right? Um, interesting question because I, 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 again, I've learned to be a lot more discerning over time, and I, I, I used to kind of. If someone was nice to me, I'd just be like, okay, this person's being nice to me, so I'll be nice to them, and now we're friends. And you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever process that someone has an agenda or someone is using me in any way, or you know, this is actually not a reciprocal relationship. I'm, um, you know, someone's speaking at me and using me, and the moment I speak, they don't give a shit. And, and so uh, I've progressively had less and less friends. Yeah. Well, I mean, in your in your position, you would. I mean, like you did mention before that you're getting hit. You know, you're getting. Even when I message you as a friend, I sometimes feel like, oh, is this appropriate? So I can imagine what it must really? be like, right? You know, you know what it's like, and then you, for you, because you're. That's why I brought it up because you're such a nice guy and you're loyal and all that. So, people, you know, do you, I hope you do realize now that people sometimes would be not on the good agenda, right? You understand that now. Yeah, I've learned it, but just like I've just had, you know, I had to have so many run-ins with people and so many weird experiences to to learn to put some boundaries in place because I didn't, I didn't have them. And you know, as soon as kind of my profile started to grow a little bit, you start to get bombarded, and I realised that like I couldn't keep up. I couldn't yeah. keep. I couldn't. I could no longer maintain. You know, people would message me and say hi, and I was like, I can't because yeah. there's there's 20 other messages here and there's 20 dms and in instagram yeah, and there's yeah. 20 messages on twitter and there's all these emails and there's all these texts and permanently you know like no matter what i did there was always going to be this massive thing and i was like i can't meaningfully connect with that yeah. many people yeah and, yeah and you know sometimes i'd have a really nice chat with someone then they'd rock up at another event and i'm like i don't, know I don't remember uh, uh, yeah i don't yeah. i don't remember your name and, I and I, you know. can i just say like i think that that's a really important important, important point up because you, what I don't want to assume, but what do you think? Like, do you think that if you maintained that and you kept on pleasing everyone that you would understand being happy? You wouldn't get no, it. No, it was very unhappy because you're trying yeah. to people please. You're, you're yeah. like taking like into, you know, the kind of personal connection, you know, like people pleasing uh, behavior, yeah. right, that you would see as mm. a psychologist or, mm. or whatever. Um I was like initially I was applying that to like everyone the world you know yes. so so you so you break out into public and you are doing interviews or you're meeting people who've read your work and whatever and you're trying to do the same thing to all these people and yeah. it's ridiculous it sort of feels like I sort of when I was watching you I felt like you were saying thank you all the time thank yeah. you thank you th- and I'm thinking so you don't really get to know anyone really and then you're not really getting to know you so I'm glad yeah. that you found a place that's a bit more grounded for you, you know what I mean? And um, yeah. okay. So yeah. if you think about your life, right, and it could be just recent or it could be beyond when you were a teenager, I want you to highlight one thing that you regret doing. Ooh. Um, I usually live with no regrets. I know. That's why um, I said before you came on air that you have to answer everything. <laughs> yeah, no, I will. I will. I'll answer all the questions. Um, like it's not doesn't have to be a regret. It's more the fact that you look back and go, I could have done that differently, maybe. Let's go with yeah. that. Like the hindsight part element of it. Um, I, look, there's definitely I <laughs> I um I said this to someone yesterday. Um I have a tendency to shoot first and ask questions later. And um so what does that mean? Does I, that mean that does that the shooting part means angry? Yeah, I have. So I have like a very, I have a, a hot temper. And, you're, Ita- you're so, Italian. I didn't know you were Italian. That makes a lot of sense there. I, yeah, yeah, Sicilian. You know, angry Italian. But I, so I, I will get very, very mad very quickly. Yeah. It also resolves very quickly. But usually, I, I will express it before I've had time to 
think about whether that's the right thing to do. Yeah. So there's been a few, there's been a handful of times where I've gone like just rage, flip my lid, jumped onto social media and like, <laughs> about something and then like just had it blow up massively and then realized like I can't take this back. Like there's, okay. there's one thing I'm, I'm not going to name, but there was a thing about a year ago that just, I felt completely justified in doing at the time. Yeah. And then I remember, like, I remember you told me uh, about it. <laughs> yeah. And, and it just, it blew up so badly. And I thought, you know, if I, if I, it, it tends to be if I'm alone, if I'm alone and something happens that makes me really angry or hurt, mm -hmm. those are the two prerequisites for me to fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> you know how funny it, 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 is, it is hearing you saying all this because I don't know if you realise that your perception online, from my perspective anyway, is that you're so chilled out and you're so calm and you're so, you know, yeah, chilled <laughs> but, out. And I can't even imagine you getting angry because I guess because it is social media, like, you know, but you are human. And I remember when you posted yeah. that post and I remember you also being sorry and, you know, so, you know, have you, do you feel like you're learning how to handle that more? Yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm learning that it's, it, you know, I, I can express, like I can say I'm angry, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Yeah. To, to you, don't, you don't, you don't have to react us. so quick. You don't have to go. On, I mean, like, I think this is just, again, my opinion. I think going online and inventing what you're feeling is something I think all of us need to learn how to not do, isn't it? Because it's that's, there then and you can't, like, people see yes. it and you can't sort of take it back. You know? That's right. But it's always, always when I'm alone. And that's what I've, like, if I'm with someone or if I can reach out to someone and they respond quickly, then uh, there is a good chance that I'm going to be able to message them and say, oh, this thing just happened, I'm mad. And I'll say, okay, I'm going to call you or I'm going to come around. And I'll vent to that person. And that takes the sting out of the whole yeah. thing. Can you hold on one sec? Sorry, hold yeah. on one sec. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, just speak like that. Because I'm just doing an interview. No, you get it when you give me the everything. You said, I'm gonna, I'll talk to you later. Sorry. All right, we'll okay. just take, take it from here. Um, all right, so let's, because I know you, uh, can you talk for a few more minutes or do you have to go? Dude, let's have a great chat. Have a long go. Yeah, I've got about 10 more minutes before I go to work. Um, right, let's smash through some questions then. Yeah. All right, so I want, you to, I want you to go back in time, right? And I want you to think about a time that you want to visit if you were able to time travel. Like what time period in your in history would be a place that you would like to visit? Just in history in general, not in my life, like just the world. The whole world. Oh, um, do you know, I really love the late 1800s, early 1900s, that kind of era where there was some technology coming in and the world was changing and um, that kind of steampunky vibe. Um, I think I would enjoy seeing that. You know, like Sherlock Holmes. Like what, what, we talk about the 70s, the 60s and 70s. No, no, like 18, 1890s and 1900s, like really, you know, just pre-World War One kind of yeah. thing. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. And, and so what draws you to that time? I just, there's something about the technology and the way the world was changing and the way it's depicted maybe, you know, there was a lot of science and rationalism coming in and, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, but like yeah. you know, that, that era in kind of Europe. I, 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 I love this question because everyone has a different answer and, you know, and because with my job, I do past life regressions. It really is interesting that, you know, everyone, like, not everyone, but a lot of people do these regressions and everyone says, oh, I was a king or I was, a, I was, everyone's famous. It's like, come on, is, is no one actually just wanting to be an everyday person? So it's interesting when the conscious mind goes there and what they say and why they mm. say it. Um, mm. I want you to think, um, I want you to tell us where would we find you at a party? So if you're at a party, where do you hang out? What's your – everyone has a little go-to place that they feel like this is where I, this is my comfy zone. Are you on the dance yeah. floor? Are you in a corner somewhere having deep talks? What's what's the Holden Shepherd party plan? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, okay. If, like Keep if it. we're talking polite company. Um, just just oh. whatever is in your mind, just don't filter. Just say it. <laughs> I, know where you, I know where you want to go. I want you to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, I, I look. I have a history of getting wasted, and uh, you know that's why I know I'd have a good time at a party with you because I, I, I would be. I'm the same as you. I just want to rage, like like the mo like if it's a big party, I'm like, let's just party. So and, like, do you? Are you loyal to someone, or are you everyone's friend? 
Um, no, I'll stick with like a, I'm usually a little cluster of mates and I'll probably just float around with them. I definitely am not centre of the party, even though yep. I'm going to be raging. And um, are you the type of person that wakes up the next day and doesn't remember? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm the kind of guy who will pass out by like nine o'clock. Oh, and, and so this, not, this, no, this I wouldn't allow that. Me. Yeah, no, this is a pattern for me. Like start drinking at three, pass out by nine, sleep for about five hours, wake up at 2 a.m. and then just rejoin the party as if nothing happened. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not a great mode of, um, of partying, but it seems to be what I do. No, I, I love it. I love it. I love that. I mean, like I also have a past history of not remembering but I sort of love that because I love my friends lying to me, making my night bigger than it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what? I I had it happen so many times that I I start to just go. I feel pretty bad. Like it, it's it, you you wake up and you're like shit. Like I I like yes, there's a kind of a cheeky grin to it, but at the same time, I'm like I really you know don't remember what it did. And when people fill in the blanks, you're like wow, I was a dick. Like I was just really <laughs> like I'm a, just a dick. You know, no, <laughs> everyone, everyone's just having, you know, um, I guess in, in saying that in your age group, what do you feel or what's your opinion on what the world is seeing about them? And how do you feel there? How do you feel like, you know, the humanity is going to evolve with your generation and the one after you? Like what I, what do you think would be, you know, again, we're, we're brainstorming here, but what would be a legacy that your generation potentially could leave the world? Um, well, we're not going to own houses, that's for sure. Um, I don't think we will. Um, yeah, some of us will. Um, I don't know. I think we'll probably be the generation that has to act on climate change and stuff like that. You know, like, like we're going to have to because the world is just going to burn up into a crisp. Yeah. Um, unless we fucking do something. Um, and I feel like we're going to be copying the brunt of it. And I don't know if older generations are going to act urgently enough. You know, they're um, not, are they? I'm sorry. They're not. They're, they're not. not. And, and it's like every day we say that, we go, oh, my. and I think about you. The, I think about the babies being born now and I think, okay, what are, what's going to happen? Like, how are they going to cope? But then I think they'll yeah. just deal with it because it's happening. They will. They will. But it's, you know, we're in a position now in the next decade or so where we can do something about it. And I'm not particularly like psychotically eco yeah crazy. well i was gonna i asked the question because i'm wondering if that impacts your fulfillment well it impacts everyone like 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 the, the the planet is so important on so many levels and and being able to breathe clean air and access clean water is is essential you know like no one's going to be talking about um self-actualization yeah and emotional fulfillment if we can't eat yeah but i was gonna but because you've sort of in other t chats with you i get the impression that you live in the moment right do you feel that that does that impact you being happy today, or or are you because you were talking about not taking on every cause? Do yeah. you feel that you you're managing really well to be aware of stuff, but not to let it impact how you enjoy the day? I think that's a good way to sum it up because I don't I I never talk about climate change. That's like the first time that I've ever <laughs> mentioned it in an interview because it's very important, but I don't devote any of my time to trying to scream about it because it, like I can't take all of those things on. Yeah. And yeah, I, otherwise you just implode. You just, well, the world does not need fewer happy people. The world yeah. needs more happy people. I mean, really quickly then, like, because I think this is something that people will take away. How, because there are a lot of people that worry, so how do you do that? How, what advice would you give to people so they don't worry about what the news is saying, they don't worry about what's happening in the future? Because... I do believe a lot of people aren't fulfilled or happy because they base everything in the future. Yeah, you know, I there's agree. either a fear or there's a wish. So you're sort of living in the moment and you're doing so much work on doing that. So what would be one thing that you do you think that keeps you grounded? Uh, just, just that the future won't fix you. Like, like, like solving the world's problems won't fix you. Solving your own problems won't fix you. Um, you, you like there's no future version where everything's okay but yeah. day by day you can sit with yourself and go I feel grounded I've had a hug you know like I've, I've spent time with my husband I went to the gym I played yeah food. I you love know, that. I a really nice meal that's so good that's, to hear that's literally it's, all there is but it is so beautiful to hear it from a younger person because I do because as a therapist I do hear a lot of the younger people talking about the future. Like I had a beautiful mm. girl last night who has got so many potential ideas, but she tell, convinces herself that she's, she can't until, there's, always, there's an until. I can't until yeah. school finishes. Or, but she doesn't realise that the, the, it's now. 
Yeah. You know? But yeah, no. But I don't think, but I also think sometimes you have to go through it to get there. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like, like you, you're very familiar, or you talk a lot about, you know, people having their journeys and that kind of thing. Um, I, I think that, you know, you have to go through it and, you know, you grab one of those things that you thought was going to solve your life. You know, I've, I've achieved my life goal. And then you're like, oh, nothing. Yeah. Nothing happened. I'm okay. still the same person. Just more people can see how fucked up I am. Yeah. Um, so, they, so I think people have to go through that sometimes. But if yeah. I can say that to other people and hopefully have them hear it, someone hear it. That yeah. I, I mean, your hard. very first question about when you answered that you reached your life goal, but you weren't happy, I think that's going to impact a lot of people. Mm. Because a lot of people Absolutely. make assumptions, right? When they see you on the platform and go, oh my God, look at him, he's happy. Oh my God, he's got everything. But you, thank you for making it normal, normalizing the fact that it doesn't define you and you're finding now happiness is, and fulfillment is coming from your internal place, right? Yeah. So the last yeah. question, oh my God, I can't believe we've gone over, is I want you to tell us what the title of your memoir would be. <laughs> What is the title of your memoir? I and mean, you have to be clever. Come on. You're... <laughs> Rough Trade, The Holden Shepherd Story. <laughs> Rough Trade, The Holden Shepherd Story, The Weirdest Thing He Does Alone. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not really singing. Oh, and and I, I, I'm going to ask this for myself. Who do you reckon will play you in the movie version? Who would be you? I mean... Oh, come on. Who do you reckon will be your, your who would be the male person that would play you? Oh, you're so um, I don't know any actors, man. Oh, who's, okay. Who's cool? That's all right. If you don't, <laughs> if you don't know any actors, we, we'd have to probably I have, I reckon we have to have you play yourself because you probably will write your memoir really young. Me. Yeah, I'll write it young. I'm so self absorbed Directed, I'll written, and acted and directed <laughs> yes. by Holden Shepherd, the <laughs> Enigma whole everything yeah. package. Total exercise and narcissism. It'd be great. Yeah. Holden, thank you so much for this wonderful 40-something minutes of exploring <laughs> your inner uh, edemonia and your fulfillment. So good luck with your – I cannot wait for your second book and I can't wait for your um, – the, the, is it a movie or a TV show? Ten-episode TV series. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to put all the information. I Googled you and there's so much information there. I'm, so I'm going to link everything down below. So thank you so much. It's a blessing to be in your life. Good luck with everything. Joey, mate, I absolutely love chatting to you again. What a fucking fun ride it is to <laughs> chat with someone like you who loves this kind of conversation. Thank you for having me, mate. Thank you. I, I'm not going to forget that weirdest thing you do alone now, ever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening to the Animated Podcast, everyone. And um, please make sure that you subscribe. Make sure you get all the links to um, Holden's information. Read up on him. He's, he's going to be a big star one day and we can all know that we've met him young. And make sure that you look out for each new episode on Wednesday. Now, season two is about to finish and we'll have season three launching in January. All right, namaste, everyone. Have a great week. Bye.